Now, with further, no further ado, let me please introduce the stage. Great to have him here, the Prime Minister of Iceland, Mr. Bjarni Benediktsson. Welcome, sir. Distinguished guests, let me thank you for uh, this opportunity to come and address you here today. I'd like to welcome you to this second international summit to advance social progress held here in Reykjavik. It is most gratifying that the summit should be held in Iceland again and that the event should be even larger than it was last year. The International Summit to Advance Social Progress brings together leaders and change makers from business, government, civil society, and academia. The Prime Minister's office is a proud supporter of this initiative. In the days to come, attendees will explore and discuss what is most important for, uh, for the welfare of a society. It may sound like a cliche to speak of concepts such as happiness, well-being, and social progress. But it is good for those of us who work in the political arena to consider what these concepts really mean and to place them into context with economic well-being. The metrics that we have used to measure prosperity have generally been linked to money in one way or, or another. We measure we measure purchasing power and inflation, interest rates, GDP growth, currency exchange rates, and the current account balance. And we believe we can say a great deal about our position in the community of nations based on these metrics. To be sure, these variables do say something about our capacity to do certain things, provide services to the public, strengthen our educational system, improve healthcare services, and build roads, to mention a few. But they do not tell us how these things can be done, nor do they tell us who may benefit from them. We do not measure happiness in terms of GDP growth. I recently read an interesting article in the New York Times bearing the title, What if sociologists had as much influence as economists? The author of the article asks why government authorities have not utilized the knowledge and uh, experience of sociologists in the same way that they have relied on economists, given that sociologists spent their careers trying to understand how societies work. The author mentions that in 1967, it was suggested that the US government establish a special council of social advisors with a role parallel to, those, uh, to that of the council of economic advisors. And I must tell you, I find this idea highly intriguing. Uh, no one doubts the importance of economists and economics as a discipline but it is worth exploring whether we take sufficient advantage of knowledge in many other areas, including sociology. It is important that government policy be evidence-based at all times, that it built on knowledge obtained in all scientific fields, and that it links those fields together. And we've been doing so in Iceland in an increasing degree in many areas, such as in the Icelandic Ocean Cluster and other clusters we've been developing, linking those fields together. For a long time, Icelanders have, as the other Nordic countries, emphasized building up strong social infrastructure at the state and local levels. And it is particularly noteworthy how well they have succeeded in ensuring both good living conditions and also GDP growth. A report by the Nordic Council suggests the reason is that the Nordic countries 
have managed to combine efficiency with increased equality, entwine security with flexibility in the labor market, whilst also remaining open to international trends. As you all know, Iceland is a scarcely populated country. We sometimes say a small country. And it is precisely because of this that we realize how important it is for each individual to make full use of his or her potential. Not so long ago, a foreign newswoman asked me why Icelanders were so advanced in matters relating to equal rights. Why labor participation among women was so strong and what had contributed to that trend? I answered, because our achievements would not have been possible without the women. Of course, one could answer these questions in many other ways, but to my mind, this is one of the key reasons why we are so fortunate, so, so fortunate as to have made such progress in equal rights. And we want to go all the way, not merely to rank first in international comparison, we want to be able to say to ourselves and others, equality reigns here, genuine equality, both legally and actually. And we want to be able to measure it. Wage equality is one of the areas where we want to improve. And to this end, we have pledged to eliminate the gender-based pay gap by 2022. And we've also pledged to implement UN's Sustainable Development Goals. It is in this context satisfying to tell you that Icelanders have been successful in having gender equality defined as a separate standalone goal. We're also proud of the fact that the United Nations University Gender Equality Studies and Training Program, UNU Guest, as we call it, operates in Iceland. Each year, UNU Guest welcomes students from around the world to its postgraduate diploma program and provides them with an interdisciplinary education which the students then use to promote equality-based initiatives in their home countries. We take our obligations seriously and work systematically towards implementing the goals, which extend to all public sectors activities in one way or another and involve society as a whole. We view the Social Progress Index as an important tool in this work, one that can help us to prioritize our goals and provide improved oversight during implementation. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to draw your attention to participants from Iceland, including experts on public health and environment, furthermore on natural resources. They will all discuss research in their fields in the coming days. We Icelanders are uniquely fortunate in that we've been using renewable energy for a long time and most of our homes and businesses use hydropower and geothermal power exclusively. While fossil fuels account for 80% of energy consumptions worldwide, in Iceland 85% of our primary, primary energy use is based on hydro and geothermal power and the other 15% on fossil fuels. We aim to increase the proportion of renewable energy still further by 2020, including increasing the shares, share of motor vehicles powered by renewables to 30% of the nation's fleet and implementing other measures in transport and fishing. Since 1979, the UN University Geothermal Training Program has operated in Iceland, offering training to experts from developing countries with geothermal power potential. Upwards of 2,000 students from dozens of developing countries have studied here in Iceland. Icelanders have a great deal to offer in this field, and it is my hope 
and belief that our expertise and experience will prove very useful to other countries and regions in the decades to come. Honored guests, events such as this summit to advance social progress help us to see things in a more complete context. It is often forgotten that countries around the world, Iceland among them, have made enormous progress in the past few decades and have greatly improved the lives of their people. Let's consider uh, a few examples of this. The percentage of desperately poor people worldwide has fallen from 60% in 1970, the year I was born, 60% to less than 10% in 2015. Over roughly that same period, the literacy rate has risen from 56% to 85%. Infant mortality worldwide has fallen from 17% around 1970 to less than 5% as of 2016. All of those signs show significant progress and should be celebrated as such. But at the same time, it is important to set new goals, goals based on this excellent progress, goals that make a difference in the lives of people worldwide. Our task is to do our best to contribute to a more balanced world, but this is no small task. How can we sustain and multiply open societies and strengthen free trade without it leading to increased inequality, which in so many places of the world, and may I say maybe not least today, exactly today, we show, see examples of this in so many places today. In so many places, increased inequality is the root cause of political tension and disunity among nations. How do we discourage the current development towards the closing of borders and reduced international cooperation in effort to ensure security? How can we strengthen international cooperation without placing increased threat on international security? Well, I leave you with these questions. I hope that your and our work here will be a stepping stone towards a better and more united world. Now let me lastly thank all of those who have put their shoulder on the wheel in preparing the summit and all of the related events. I look forward to hearing the discussions taking place here. It is our responsibility to share knowledge and to put use the expertise of other nations and with that to build a stronger, happier and more just societies in the globe. Thank you.